the title I gave this was From Neoliberal to Liberal Capitalism, which was intended to be provocative because someone might say, well, what's the difference between them? Or someone might say, but liberal capitalism was what we had before neoliberalism, so how can you go, does that mean you want to go backwards? Uh, no, I don't mean I want to go backwards at all. Uh, I'm going to try and explain now what I mean by from neoliberal to liberal capitalism by talking about what I understand liberalism to mean and then trying to show how neoliberalism is not actually very liberal. It's only liberal in a very, very restricted sense. Uh, and as a result, it has many flaws as a way of governing human affairs. And then I want to talk at the end about um, so what, what would be the alternatives to a neoliberal approach to capitalism and, and what are the obstacles in doing that. Uh, so uh, one starting point is that I, uh, an acceptance that we are going to live in a capitalist economy for the foreseeable future, and also my own belief, and this is, this is a very, this is a quite a normative um, lecture, this. Right? Uh, several of you are lawyers. Now, lawyers are always normative. And often I criticise lawyers, but I say, you're too normative, you've got to be more scientific. And lawyers say, no, we're a normative discipline. Uh, no, no, I'm meant to be a social scientist, so I'm not supposed to be normative. This is a normative talk. Um, I, I, I'm accepting capital, a capitalist economy, and I'm also saying uh, we're probably better off doing that than trying to have radical alternatives to capitalism. And that might be something you want to talk about when we have discussion at the end. Um, talking about discussion, I better take my watch off so I don't talk the entire time we have at our disposal. Um, obviously, if I say we should, it's good to have a capitalist economy, I'm meaning, and this is part of what I'm going to mean by liberal, uh, a capitalist economy that also can accommodate a large role for state activities, for publicly owned resources, and also for activities that are neither capitalist nor state things from civil society. Uh, but basically, I'm accepting a capitalist economy. And now, what do I mean by liberal? By liberal, I mean a kind of ideology or an approach that accepts a large amount of diversity in human affairs. Uh, partly, liberalism just values diversity for its own sake. But also, philosophically, it says we need diversity because we are never sure that we are right. And this is Karl Popper's vision, really, of, of, of philosophy, that, that we might always be wrong. And we might one day discover that we're wrong. And we want to change our minds. So we must always have the possibility of pursuing alternative paths. We must accept the possibility of error. We must accept change. And we can only do that if we allow a diversity uh, of things to, to flourish and to exist. Uh, which means also liberalism implies a tolerance, which is different from acceptance. Acceptance is quite a positive thing. You say, yes, I want there to be diversity uh, as, a, a, as a positive value. Tolerance is, is, is more narrow than that. You just say, yeah, I, I don't like this, but I, I've got to accept it's still there. Right? Uh, so the only thing liberalism permits you to be, uh, not to tolerate is intolerance itself. So uh, that's my model of liberalism against which I'm going to compare and contrast neoliberalism. But I also argue that liberalism as a political strategy can only actually realise itself uh, in its best form through social democracy. I've actually written something called uh, Social Democracy as the Highest Form of Liberalism. And the reason I argue this is that liberalism does have, a, a part of that notion of, of acceptance of diversity, a basic idea of equality, some kind of sense of equality. That um, 
it, you can only really have considerable diversity if a lot of different groups and interests have got a possibility to express themselves. Uh, but equality in an economic sense is very difficult to realise uh, unless you really try hard to do it. Equ equality doesn't emerge out of the normal traffic of life. E uh, there are very strong tendencies within the market and within human life in general to, 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 to make things more unequal. So the, to trying to pursue the liberal vision that every individual has a, should have an opportunity to realise themselves, to, be, to, to, to develop, you can only really do that with quite a lot of intervention. Intervention of a kind that classic liberalism didn't accept and didn't understand. Uh, liberalism and neoliberalism tend to stop with the idea of equality of opportunity. So that everyone should have the chance, yes, everyone should have an equal chance to succeed and to thrive. But you cannot, have inequal you cannot have equality of opportunity, this is a simple point, very well recognised, unless there is some equality of starting conditions. So if you imagine a society in which, yes, there is equality of opportunity, a society of complete equality, everybody, all, every child gets an equal chance. Now at the end of that process, some people have been more successful than others, some are richer than others, some have, get, have got a cultural inheritance that's bigger than others. The second generation therefore has no equality of opportunity because the children of the more favoured obviously have a better chance than those of the unfavoured. So the, the, the equality of opportunity only ever works for one generation. It can only be something that continues if there are constant attempts at reducing inequalities. Also, the, the idea of, of equality of opportunity is rather narrow and it, it normally means uh, in a, a, a chance to succeed materially. But if we, if we look at the concept of equality of life, of, look at, look at, look at, not much equal, looking at, at life as something where people should have a chance to develop what Amartya Sen calls their capabilities. This is something that goes beyond just what sort of job people get, but their capabilities to enjoy and have a rich life. Uh, to, get, to get equality of that needs an enormous amount of public policy and health and education <laughs> and many other areas. And so if the, liberalism has a vision of a kind of universal uh, achievement, a universal equality of, achieve, uh, of chances, it actually needs to go far further than than liberalism itself, and it therefore actually needs the strategies of intervention that only social democracy has really developed as positive policies. And so for me, uh, liberalism, liberal capitalism, actually uh, requires, in the end, a lot of social democratic politics. Now, how do we look at neoliberalism uh, in that context? Neoliberalism is liberal to the extent that it believes in the market. Now, the market is one of the ways in which liberalism expresses itself. If, if liberalism is about diversity, a, an ability to change your mind, an ability to, to adapt, uh, an uh, ability to be flexible, uh, ability to change, then the uh, ability to recognise a particular path has been wrong and you need to adjust, then the market is actually one of the institutions that enables human beings to do that. If you have an economy that doesn't really use the market, then all those things about adaptability and change, ability to realise when you're wrong, are mu much more difficult to, 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 uh, to, to achieve. Uh, and if we, if we look at the history of the Soviet economies, I think we see this, that uh, it was, that was a model that... They used markets in the Soviet system, but in a very controlled way. And that system simply couldn't adapt and change. Uh, when it got into a crisis, all it could do was collapse entirely. Whereas capitalism, uh, using markets, has this ability to adapt. It meets crises, like in 2008, but it can come out of crisis. It can change its ways 
it, it, it's like one of those insects that can keep changing its color, well, not it, yeah, insects and reptiles, that can change their color according to the context they're in. Capitalism is able to do that. We might not always like what it does, but it, it's got this capacity to change. So the market, market capitalism, is very much a part of liberalism. But for neoliberalism, that's it. Market full stop. So what do we do if the thing that's going wrong is the market itself? Because there, there can be no market in markets. There's, there is just the market. Um, certainly the neoliberal vision of the market, there is just one market. And, and that's the only mechanism they're really happy with. And so what, why I say neoliberalism is only partly liberal is because it sees only this one institution. Uh, and it's not prepared to see a need sometimes not to use that institution. It's, it's got a concept of market failure, and I'm going to spend quite a lot of time in a few minutes talking about market failure, but it has a very limited concept of market failure. It's something that only the market can change. Uh, and so for me, neoliberalism isn't really liberal because it's unable to use a wide variety of institutional mechanisms if it needs to change and adapt. Um, and it's interesting here to start by looking, look, looking at neoliberalism and its problems, to compare neoliberalism with its historical predecessor, which is the German and Austrian school of ordo-liberalism, ordo-liberalismus, strictly speaking. Now, it, it, the ordo-liberalen have had uh, considerable influence, and it's, you, could, you could argue that today they have far too much influence still on German financial policy, uh, given that it's something that emerged in the years of the final collapse of the Weimar Republic, uh, threats of a kind of communist revolutions around bits, different bits of Germany, and eventually the triumph of Nazism. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's a view of the world that emerges out of that very peculiar atmosphere of Germany of the 1930s. So I say it's, it's, it's strange that it still is important. But it, it had, there are three major characteristics of order liberalism, uh, two of which contrast very strongly with its child, its American child, which is neoliberalism. Uh, the first characteristic is one that it shares and which it gave to, to, to neoliberalism. And that was the idea that the state should have as limited a role as possible in society and that the market uh, should be what governs most human affairs. Um, and this, in a way, one can understand if you're looking at people uh, who, on the one hand, have got Soviet communism, on the other hand, they've got the Nazi state. You can see why some of these people might have wanted to say the state should have as small a role as possible and that the market should govern affairs. And that is, I say, that's, the, that's the, what they, they gave. That's the, the, the neoliberals start from there. And if you look at Friedrich von Hayek, uh, who was one of the order liberal and, and became, uh, so he starts in that period in, in, in Vienna, actually, in, in the, the Weimar, well, well it wasn't Weimar, in, it, it, in sort of pre, well, in, in just sort of pre-Hitler time, uh, in Vienna and post, post that, he then left, went to the United States, uh, but then lived on to become a major influence on, um, on Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. And Margaret Thatcher went into her first cabinet meeting with Hayek's books and said, that's what we're going to do. Uh, <laughs> something that came out of the crisis in Austria in the 1930s. Um, but the, the, but the other, two, two other characteristics of the order liberalen which are different from neoliberals. First was uh, that they believed that the market and capitalism should only be part of life. Uh, now, in a way, they're, they're quite old-fashioned conservatives, in, in a sense, rather than liberals, in that they believed it was very important that workers should not just spend their lives in factories. They must have time free to work in what the Germans call Kolonialgarten. Do you, is that what you call them here? Colonial, Kolonialgarten, do you have that concept? No, we call them allotments in English. 
you, you have that. You understand those, right? Well, those things, right? Germans had that. Scandinavians, Germans, British, a few other cultures have these things. They believed it was important that workers have a chance to, to work in their little vegetable gardens, which, where, where they weren't making things for the capitalist market. They should have a chance to go to church. They should be able to go to a football match. They, so they believed it was very important that the market had its part of life, uh, but that th the rest of life should be free of it. Uh, Second thing they believed was that a competitive order had to be maintained. That, uh, that you, the, the thing you really must avoid in the economy was the development of monopoly and imperfect competition. Competition and the, the, the role of the market was a permanent feature. And if monopolies and imperfect competition developed, then you did need the state. The state's role was to maintain the competitive order. Uh, and, and so the state was not entirely absent. It had this job to maintain competition, and competition was permanent. And that, these are two characteristics that are not actually uh, shared by neoliberalism. Um, the, the, neolib the, one of the interesting ways in which economic theory has developed in the neoliberal schools of the universities of Chicago and of Virginia in particular, uh, was by trying to show how you could use the market to model almost every aspect of life and that virtually every aspect of life would be improved by being treated like a market. And, and in the end, ultimately, in the concept of the market is that there is one market. You ought to be able to compare the value of anything with something else by looking at some, an analogy of price. Uh, and in, in the case of Gary Becker, one of the famous neoliberal writers, this extends to the family. Right? He has, he has a, 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 mar, a, a market model of family relationships. So, Whereas the neo-order liberal Ireland thought it was important, whole areas of life were just outside the market so we could just get on with living. For, for neoliberals, no, since the market guarantees efficiency, you really want every institution uh, to, to, to have rules like markets. But if, if you're not making decisions about price, then you're being inefficient. And if you're inefficient, you're wasting human resources and you really shouldn't be doing that. It's a kind of almost moral offence. A uh, second characteristic of, um, of neoliberals, where there's a, in, in a way a division among them actually, uh, and that is that they, that an idea that the role of the state is to ensure virtually permanent competition, they did find uh, to be rather challenging. Um, partly, well, you can look at this cynically or you can look at this generously. Looking at it cynically, too many of them were getting paid by large corporations to want to maintain that belief. Uh, uh, or, uh, and one's thinking more of the lawyers and the economists here, um, or one could say actually they just realised that in l many sectors of a modern economy, you simply can't maintain constant competition. You, you, or, or large numbers of competitor firms. There's some, the, the tendencies towards concentration are so strong in some sectors, it's stupid trying to insist there must be lots of producers. And this, this came to a head really during the 1970s when, or early 80s, when uh, the the US economy was beginning to have trouble competing in particular against German and Japanese competition. This is before the Chinese entered the American demonology. Um, and the, a lawyer, there's this Chicago School of Law and Economics it came to the administration, the Reagan administration. They said, look, uh, one reason we're falling behind is we, you have this stupid antitrust law uh, that every time a firm gets too big within its market, the, the antitrust people come along and try and break it up. Uh, and actually antitrust, they said, was a form of communism, really. But maintaining constant competition was a form of communism because it, it was a form of constant state intervention. Um, 
and the Reagan administration listened to this and several of the academic lawyers who'd been developing these ideas were appointed as judges in the commercial courts. And US antitrust law then went into a period when it said maintaining the competitive order doesn't mean you have to keep on having competition. It means when someone's won the competition, become the biggest firm, or what, three or four biggest firms in a sector, they have the right to keep those prizes. That's the competitive order, is giving prizes to the winners of the competition. So there, there's a complete division within neoliberal thinking. Uh, on the one hand, one's got those who continue to believe, no, we must keep trying to reproduce competition. And the, in a way, they're, they're the ones who are theoretically more pure because the whole concept of the market economy and the role of the market as, as having this dominating role in life is that the market enables us to keep choosing. Right? The, 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 the market is where you get the power to choose, whether you're an cons ultimate consumer or a, a purchasing firm, you've all, you keep on getting the right to choose. And if, if firms don't do very well, they leave the market and that increases efficiency. New firms can easily enter the market, which improves diversity. And that, that's the kind of model of the market that uh, is offered to us. But of course, if you, if you say, well, actually, the competitive order means that some firms win and that they then get the prizes, that model is, becomes very, very weak because you no longer get this constant choice. Um, so in a way, the, so there's, a, there's a kind of theoretical purity about those neoliberals who've continued to believe in the market as permanent competition. But they've also been unrealistic. Um, and in, uh, I'll talk in a minute about why they're unrealistic. Um, the other ones, are what I call corporate neoliberals, um, who believe there's an outcome to competition. It's, it, often it's totally artificial if you try and, um, and break up large firms uh, and what, or, or, or try and force large firms to permit minor competitors to stay in the market. Uh, all you're doing there is, is keeping inefficiency going. Because if a firm can't survive in the market, it's actually using resources badly. Better wipe it out. Um, one notable occasion when this argument was used was in the case of Microsoft before the European Court uh, of Justice. Because the, the, bo both the US courts and the European courts of, of, of uh, commercial courts have continue to have struggles, really, between these two models of, of, of what does competition mean. Uh, the, the Europeans have been less willing than the Americans to uh, accept the, the notion of competition as something that is won. And they're more, the European Court of Justice is more likely to, uh, to insist that competition must be maintained. And so it's often it's usually, usually in the European Court that cases against uh, large corporations uh, re lead to dramatic consequences. And in the case of Microsoft, it was when they were, uh, Apple was sort of dying, really. And the case was brought that Microsoft, Microsoft were refusing to allow Apple products to use their platforms. And so you, if, you, if you bought Apple computers, then all you could use uh, was Apple equipment. You couldn't have access to any Microsoft software. Microsoft were producing extraordinary software. And the case of Microsoft was Apple is a stupid failing business. It's a in totally inefficient, incompetent model. We ought to be allowed to crush it. And the consumers would gain from the death of Apple because they would then get our efficient products without having to have this nonsense. And the courts found against Microsoft and found that they, uh, they, they, and decreed that they had to uh, permit Apple access, permit Apple products to use the Microsoft software uh, in order to sustain competition. Now here we are about 15 years later with Apple being a loathsome monopoly capitalist that, that's trying to drive everybody out. So clearly Microsoft were wrong 
in arguing that there was no future in Apple and that sustaining it in the market would only lead to inefficiency. On the other hand, Apple itself has become similar monopoly, showing just how difficult it is to sustain markets in these areas. But that was a very, it was an important case for testing out these two ideas of what the competitive order is. Now, so, so, so neoliberals have got these two things to where they've departed from the original ordo liberalism. Uh, one, this really not accepting that any area of life should be free of market forces. And secondly, however, and I'm in contradiction to that, accepting that the market can mean uh, a, a kind of more or less end to competition because of the acceptance uh, of, imperv of large corporations. Now, going on from there, looking in more detail at the general contestation of both ordo liberals and neoliberals, the other that, that really the market can solve most of life's problems. Um, and therefore doesn't need that wider range of institutional possibilities that I said liberalism and social democracy do entertain. And this is where we come to the idea of market failure, which is a, a concept neoliberals use. They will admit, yes, the market sometimes fails. And, and some of them will then say, well, yeah, and actually there is a role for the state in, in trying to, to ensure the market can work. Others will say, no, uh, if, 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 if a human goal is worth having at all, then the market will find a way. So th 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 there's, uh, in, t in practice, in public policy terms, the former always wins. It, 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 it's very difficult to define a, public, a perceived problem as not actually existing. Um, and so neoliberals are usually found uh, devising ways in which the state can create markets uh, where they don't exist in order to solve some of these market failures. Um, wh wh one area of uh, market failure is, is in the area of, of public, what economists call public goods. And these are goods with, a very, with two very strange characteristics. That they're, they're called non-rival and non-excludable. Uh, non-rival, it means that the consumption by one person of the good doesn't actually prevent another person uh, from, from having access to it. And if there's a loaf of bread on sale in a shop and I buy that loaf, you can't have it. Uh, but if I breathe in some air, it doesn't stop you breathing as well. Actually, this, is, this may be becoming untrue uh, uh, as we pollute the air around us, but it, the fresh air is a kind of public good in that we don't, we're not really fighting for access to fresh air. And it's not excludable in that I can't stop you breathing. Right? I can't require you to uh, not to breathe air unless I sell you a, a, an oxygen cylinder. Right? And the, the, the market solution to a problem of inadequate fresh air would be that we're all required, that we're not allowed to breathe the air. We can only breathe through oxygen cylinders that we buy from an entrepreneur. Uh, that would be the market solution to the problem of polluted air. But the problem with public goods is that although they're non-rival, non-excludable, they can be damaged. And, and this is the pollution question. I mean, t two of these market failures relate, relate to the pollution question. This first one does. Um, so a, a public good, uh, and the ocean is a, is a public good. Uh, well, fish are not, uh, fish are, <laughs> it's non, they're non-excludable, because as the British are going to discover soon, you, you can't actually stop fish swimming in and out of the waters, but uh, uh, they won't carry passports. Um, but you, they might be rival. Uh, but in, it's, but that, the resources like that where it's very difficult, or if actually impossible really, to, um, to exclude people. Uh, and where there's, it's very difficult to create markets. Neoliberalism has a great problem with solving problems that appear in that area, in those areas. Because if there is a problem of a public good being damaged, the neoliberal answer is, well, if you made this a private good, then someone would own it 
and they would therefore uh, and they would need to market access to it and they would therefore make sure they looked after it so if there's a problem of uh, beautiful areas of nature being damaged by, by, by tourists uh, leaving litter and starting fires. The answer is you let someone buy that beautiful area, they charge admission to it, and they then have an incentive to keep it clean. So the, 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 if there's a problem of public goods that are being neglected, then the answer is let someone own it. Uh, but for a lot of public goods, that simply isn't possible because the scale is too large. And even if you do let someone own it, you then get monopolies developing. So public goods are a real problem for neoliberal arguments. And as we get more and more issues of pollution, extending to the climate itself, which no one can own, you couldn't even, you couldn't even let Microsoft own the climate and charge us access to it, uh, then neoliberal answers neoliberal solutions to problems run into great difficulty. The, other, the, other, the second one which relates very strongly to pollution is the idea of externalities. And an externality for economists is, is when there's a, a, a market exchange. Right? There's, there's a, something being produced by a whole series of market processes. So imagine a, a, a factory that buys raw materials, it hires labour, it produces goods which it sells to a public. All of that is market exchanges. Buying the raw materials, but well, buying the factory itself, buying the workers, selling the goods. Everything's a market exchange. But as a byproduct of that, uh, the factory is polluting a river. And downstream from the river, there are some people trying to fish. And they can't, the fish are all dying because the factory is polluting it. Now, for the factory, that's not a problem because it's got a set of market exchanges, raw materials, labour, selling the product. The fact it's polluting a river and destroying someone's fishing is irrelevant to it. It doesn't come in its calculation. Uh, and so this, uh, an externality is something that's rec well, negative externality, so it can be positive ones. Um, positive externality, uh, you walk past the baker's shop, you can enjoy breathing in the beautiful smell of the bread cooking. There's nowhere the baker can charge you for that, right? It's something that's produced by a market activity, but they can't capture it in their profits. Positive externalities don't matter. Negative externalities do. Uh, how do you, it, 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 this is something that's happening outside the market. How do you solve it? Now, the neoliberals had an answer to this because they said, and this goes back to the 1930s, this argument, and it the, 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 the way the argument was working, this is, especially it's in Chicago again, uh, it, they had an argument about it, which very much belongs to that time. Um, they said, well, if there's an economic activity that is causing damage to some people outside the scope of the market, it's still something that's producing value, right? That factory is still producing products that are of value. How do we know the value of those products is not um, more important than uh, the loss to the people who can't make, get their fish anymore? The only way is to find out if the people whose fish are being killed are willing to pay the factory owner enough money not to pollute the river. And if they're willing to pay that much, then their activity is more valuable. If they're not, then tough. Your fish die because this factory is more important. Now, that, that works all right. Actually, the original argument they used was about cattle farmers and sheep farmers, which, as I say, belongs to the Chicago economy of the 1930s. But, uh, the point is this, this assumes that you can identify a group of persons who are being negatively affected by a market activity, and that it's reasonable to expect them to stump up money to pay for it. That really doesn't deal with the is environmental issues that we have today, where uh, the whole planet is potentially affected. It's no good saying, is the, is the population of the Earth willing to compensate uh, the, 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 the people who'd want to chop down Brazilian rainforests in order to stop them doing it. And are we all willing to stump up and pay them enough money? Uh, especially when you're talking about the population of the whole world, you're talking about population with very, very different levels of income. And so the whole climate change issue and environmental damage issue simply is too big 
for either the public goods argument or the externalities argument. This is why I say neoliberalism falls down. Uh, and it's not surprising that quite a lot of neoliberal economists are climate change deniers. Because the only way to deal with this is to say, well, it's, not, it's, 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 it's nothing we can do about it. It's not a human issue. So the, the, it's not relevant to the market. So these are two areas where I say neoliberalism, which has, em has emerged, I, I, I think, I, well, at the time I was writing about these things a few years ago, it seemed to be the unchallenged game in town from the late 70s right through to the beginning of this century. It was absolutely dominant, and political parties of almost all persuasion wanted to get a bit of neoliberalism in their DNA. Uh, but uh, today it, it, it becomes increasingly difficult to sustain that this is the ideology or the economic or the theory that's going to solve many of our problems. <clears throat> then there are those problems I've already mentioned really. The problem that what, do near, what, what does market theory have to say about the rest of life. This is this is not quite the same as externalities. You know, externalities, one's thinking of, of life that's damaged by market transactions. But just generally, the rest of life, if, 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 if we can only make decisions through the market, what about whole chunks of life that um, are outside the market? How, how, how do they get any attention at all? Uh, if everything is only got value, if it's got a monetary value and can be traded in the market, uh, how do we protect other values? How do we ensure the study of history gets as much money as the study of law? Just to take an example. Um, how do we ensure it gets any money at all? Um, and the neoliberal, well, the old ordo liberals would have, would have had a great answer. They'd have had an answer to that. They said, well, uh, yeah, we'd, look, look, there's got to be whole chunks of life outside the market. Problem for that is that the market is very invasive. It, 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 it tries to get hold of all other, of other areas of life. And to the extent that money becomes central to giving value to something, those things that are outside money tend to get, be very, very vulnerable and simply overlooked. Uh, or at worst, uh, some neoliberals, not all of them, would argue, well, things that don't, can't make a profit shouldn't exist. Their mere existence is an inefficiency and therefore a waste of resources. People aren't willing to pay for historians, then it means they're a bad thing to have. Abolish them. Um, so th 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 that's a, again where, as I say, neoliberalism isn't actually liberal because it's not prepared to say, well, we need to ensure a diversity of things in human life. And we need to ensure that things outside the market can flourish. And we need to accept that economic efficiency isn't the only yardstick for human value. Uh, and that, if neoliberals are willing to say, yeah, okay, I accept that, then all right, they can come into the liberal family. But if they're not willing to say that, then they're not liberal. They're actually anti-liberal in this crucial area. Then another area that is extremely problematic um, for neoliberal ideas, it, it, which I've already touched on um, earlier on, and that is the approach to inequality. So another, another kind of market failure is what happens if inequalities build up to a point where pe large numbers of people cannot make transactions in the market. Because the, the market model assumes that people, or, you, or units, because actually there aren't many people in the theory of the market, there are units. Right? They might be people, they might be other things. It assumes everyone's got a chance to express their choice by using money. And if inequality, if there's a very large inequality uh, of resources, then uh, actually people can't do that. Uh, now, what does that mean? Now, some of the more extreme neoliberal thinkers would say, well, the distribution of resources among human beings is a reflection of their efficiency in the market. And it's important for the efficiency of the overall system 
that the efficient are the ones who are making the decisions. So if you're very poor, it means you are really not an efficient thing to have, so you shouldn't really be making many decisions. And, uh, uh, or you should perhaps have an incentive to make yourself more efficient. So that the inability of poor people to access resources should serve as an incentive there to them to get better. And this assumes a world in which it is relatively easy to overcome problems of steep inequality. And actually, the theory of the market does have a kind of message of that kind in it. Because the, 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 the model of the market assumes that uh, resources go follow the law of supply and demand. So if there is a short supply of a particular good, or it might be a human skill, that's a human skill, easiest thing to say. So that hum a particular human skill is in short supply, then the, the law of supply and demand means that the, the price of that skill will go up. Right? Just more, a lot of people want to buy the use of this skill. There aren't many people with it. Their income rises and there is inequality. That, if the market is working properly, should serve as a signal to other people to go and get that skill. Think, oh, bankers are earning a lot more than me. Perhaps I should be a banker. You get reskilled, you become a banker. The, su the supply of bankers increases. Therefore, the rewards of bankers comes down. So the, the law of supply and demand should mean, if, if, market, if markets were solving everything, and if markets are working perfectly, then a market economy should be characterised by successive waves of inequality and equality. You should find that particular occupations or particular kinds of activity, particular sectors, acquire a lot of reward, and then after a time, that goes down. And you do see this sometimes, actually. It, 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 it does work. Uh, so it means that a, a properly functioning market economy should have inequality in it, because that's the signal that serves, but it should be restrained. That degree of inequality should be restrained because if the market's working properly, because uh, short, high income signals a shortage of supply, should therefore signal an increase in supply, which should lead to a reduction of price. Uh, the problem is that it doesn't happen re enough. And it doesn't happen because the, the distribution of resources cannot easily always respond to market change. For, for a whole load of, of reasons, actually. I mean, that skills can be too difficult to acquire. Uh, some skills take a very long time to, uh, 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 to acquire, and so therefore market signals very rarely can actually increase a, a, a rise in, in, in supply. Uh, but also, there are sectors of the economy where rewards are very high for reasons that don't actually have to do with a competition, a, a competitive process that can be resolved. Partly, this is happening in the present day economy because of the consequences of financialization. Financialization means that uh, the value, the, the, the rewards going to a particular activity depend not so much on that activity satisfying a consumer demand, but on a willingness of people in the financial markets to believe that that activity has a future. Uh, and that means that the, it's it, the estimation of the market that if you buy a particular asset, you could sell that asset to a wider range of other people who also believe this has a future, who believe it has a future because they believe there are other people out there to whom they could sell it who would also believe it has a future. So that kind of process it has, what, uh, has been in particular fun, uh, pushing the extreme rewards to the financial sector itself because of its ability to sell on risk uh, to ever-increasing circles with ever-increasing values. Uh, it, it's why, for example, during the, 
the period running up to the dot-com crisis at the beginning of this century, uh, when it, 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 it firms sometimes found they could get an increase in their share price simply by changing their name to something with dot-com as words at the end of it. People, ah, oh, they're in the IT sector, this is a share with the future. So there was a process there uh, whereby uh, the, the valuation of financial assets was leading to rewards that bore no relation to what was actually going on in the real economy. Now, you might say, yeah, but this is a good example of uh, a kind of inequality that eventually, uh, eventually crashes. Uh, but it crashes not because there's a big increase in the supply of the provision of the activity, but because there's a collapse of the beliefs. Uh, so this, the market here adjusts not in a gradual way, but through shocks that, that hurt the whole system. Uh, and the, the 2008 crisis was the biggest example of that. Uh, so you had enormous build-up of, of incomes and rewards to a very small group of people, eventually leading to a crash. Because we're all so dependent on the financial sector, the priority of coming out of the crash was to let the financial sector return to profitability. So they had to be protected from an austerity that was imposed on the rest of us. And so the process of unequal, unequal rewards to the financial sector has, has actually been reinforced even by their own crash. So it seems to me that this, the unequal rewards going to finance at the present time um, are not vulnerable to correction by the market. And if you remember that famous phrase that was used during the financial crisis, that the banks were too big to fail. Now, the theory of the market does not permit the concept of too big to fail. Uh, if markets can only act efficiently if new actors can come in, new firms can enter a market, and firms not doing well can come out. Bankruptcy is an essential part of an efficient market economy. If firms have got so big that their bankruptcy, their departure from the market, would cause a crisis that the market can't tolerate, then the market is not, is, is, has lost its capacity to act efficiently. Uh, and, and this is what's happened with the financial sector. We also have, um, uh, we also have now a number of sectors in the economy where that market clearing process is simply not working. Uh, this, this is one of the things, ironically, that led to the, 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 the neoliberal doctrine that, that competition, the competitive order cannot be sustained indefinitely. You have to accept winners and losers. Uh, there's a number of sectors where it seems that simply can't happen. Um, the energy sector, for example, with la the oil production especially, where you need enormous resources in order to, to, to be active in that sector. It's very difficult for new actors to come in. Uh, and then more recently, we've had, the, uh, and this is going to become increasingly important, if we look at the information technology sector uh, and the internet. It's been extraordinary how the internet has gone from being an infant industry with very large numbers of players uh, which is what you expect with an infant industry, lots of it. Very, very rapidly, it's gone to uh, a sector dominated by a tiny number of firms. You know, Google, Apple, just it's, it's, it's about five of them, the internet giants. They have stock exchange valuations going far beyond what they're actually trading in. But there's also a very strong tendency to monopoly in that sector for a very important reason. And that is that it's... The, in, the, the sector consists of networks and it, networks have an interesting characteristic that nearly everybody wants to be a customer of the biggest one, perhaps the biggest two or three. Right? This is very different for, say, for the, the, from the, um, uh, the, 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 the market in, in, in high quality clothing. Uh, no one in high quality clothing 
wants to be buying their clothes from exactly the same shop as everyone else. The whole point is to be diverse, right? So you, the market in high quality clothing is always a good market. It's, it's got lots of competitors in it because we all want to be a bit different. And you, you don't say to someone, look, be, you, be, be distinctive, buy from the same shop as everyone else. But with, with networks, it, does, it, it, it works the other way. We, no one wants to, to join the 20th biggest network. If you want to be in a network, the point of being in the network is, is the size of it. And so there's an enormous stress towards very rapid elimination of nearly all other competitors. This applies to the networks themselves. It also applies to platform firms, firms who base their businesses on networks. No one wants to hire a taxi from the 25th biggest taxi firm in the town because it's not got many cars. Everyone move, wants to move towards the very biggest network. And this then leads to an investment strategy by firms that if you want to become the biggest uh, network, uh, you need to get rid of all opposition. So if you've got a large number of very wealthy backers, they will in invest in you and allow you to make losses for several years while you price yourself very low so you gradually drive out all the competitors because they can't raise, they can't put their prices as low as you. Or when you've got rid of them all, you are dominating that network and you're the only one in town or in the country or in the world. Now, so we've got sectors at the moment, that, that the very characteristic sectors of the new economy have these network characteristics, which means that the uh, competitive model isn't working and it means that enormous inequalities are going to develop. Uh, and the neoliberal model uh, simply doesn't uh, have a, a capacity to cope with that. It simply, it simply can't deal with it. it uh, and so it, it, its inequalities are unattended to. Now, we, we know what to do about these problems. See, and it, neoliberalism became a very dominant ideology during the 80s and 90s uh, for various reasons. We've now seen through the financial crisis, through the development of network economies, through the climate change crisis, we've seen how it's inadequate. Uh, and it, it doesn't take great brains to work out what to do about it. And the, the idea that, there's an idea often around that neoliberalism is the only game in town, that all the other ideologies have been smashed by it. It's not the case. There, you, you, anywhere you can find lots of ideas what to do, ways of regulating, uh, ways of, um, of redistributing, taxation systems, trade unions contesting the dominance of corporate power. There, there, there's, not, there's no shortage of ideas. Uh, what has been going wrong in recent years is that there's been an acceptance by other political traditions that this was the only game in town. And so other tr political traditions have adapted themselves to become more neoliberal and have therefore forgotten the value of what they had themselves. Uh, just uh, I'm running out of time, I'll just give a few examples. Um, it, it, it has been clear for some time, and this is but one of the things that gives neoliberalism its strength. It's clear that we're going through a period of enormous change in occupations and sectors of the economy. Whole industrial areas, industrial sectors are just disappearing in the Western world, uh, partly through global competition, partly through automation. And instead, new kinds of work are, uh, are, are developing. And yet in many countries, we have a system of helping workers' security by protecting people in the jobs that they have, uh, making it difficult to sack people. Uh, not for individual offences, but because their job's no longer needed. And, and this became one of the issues that neoliberals used very heavily, and that, 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 that job protection laws were preventing the market operating efficiently. Then, People did, people, policymakers did start to realise that actually uh, people, did, people in the economy did actually need a bit of security in their lives. Uh, and a, a world in which people didn't know from one day to the next whether they had a job or not, 
and where when they lost it, they were in a desperate state. They were, that's, that wasn't good. It wasn't viable. And so policymakers in Europe and elsewhere were a bit puzzled. And then they discovered the Dutch and then they discovered the Danes. And concentrating on the Danish case, because that's where we are, they said, aha, the Danes have reduced their job security laws quite considerably. They made it much easier to sack people. But they have, and uh, uh, almost alone in the world actually, uh, very, very good active labour market policies for retraining people, helping them get new jobs. So new social policy will be you get rid of job security laws, but you provide all this training and active labour market policy. Uh, and this was a model recommended around Europe. Uh, but they didn't notice two other things that the Danes had, although they're losing them now. Uh, one was extremely generous unemployment pay, uh, and secondly, extremely strong trade unions. So it wasn't just the promise of active labour market policy that enabled Danes to, 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 to not to worry so much as other people about losing their jobs. There was also these bits of old social policy that were still valuable. Uh, and the, 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 there's a, a word was developed to describe the Danish phenomenon called flex security, uh, flexible security. But it left out the parts of um, the parts of the, the Danish model that neoliberals didn't like. And new social democrats around Europe said, "Aha, right, flex security is the thing. Don't need that. We don't need." Uh, job security laws, uh, what we do need is to make sure there's some training. And they, this was gradually developed and, and imitated, but with forgetting the other part of the story. Um, also, um, there was a, something else that le actually leads us on to a topic beyond today's topic, so it's always good to stop when there's something else to talk about. Uh, the problem of inequality. Social Democrats have always had inequality as an issue on their agenda. But as they started to be influenced by neoliberal ideas, then inequality became a bit of an embarrassment because it meant uh, disobeying neoliberal rules, it meant saying you've got, you, you don't accept the inequalities that come out of the market, you, you, you redistribute. And neoliberals really didn't like that. Neoliberalism is a model of low taxation, low public spending. So the main mechanism for redistribution was, was being seen as problematic. But, near, but social democrats had this concept of reducing inequality. Well, they did, and not only them, but also uh, liberal and conservative politicians. They defi redefined what inequality referred to. And they did it in a way that was both intelligent, uh, but also uh, disastrous. Um, they said, well, yes, the inequality is a problem. Inequality is a problem if women haven't got equal chances with men. Inequality is a problem if, if, if immigrants and people from ethnic minorities haven't got the same chances as, peop as native people. Ine inequality is a problem if people are being punished for their sexual diversity uh, or, or because they've got handicaps. So inequality was redefined as not to be about inequalities in the distribution of income coming out of the market process as such, but because certain social definitions of persons meant that they were suffering from inequalities. Now, I say this was intelligent for two reasons. It was intelligent because partly, if it, uh, partly because neoliberals could accept that sort of thing. Neo neoliberals could accept, for neoliberals, everyone should be equal in the marketplace. Right? Ne ne market, uh, uh, classical economic theory is gender blind, race blind, sexual orientation blind. Right? There are units out there. And anything that, that makes one unit for an arbitrary reason seen as inferior to another it, it is, is inefficient, got to be got rid of. So this neoliberals could share this concept of inequality. Secondly, it was, it, was, it was intelligent because these are real problems. Uh, and in particular, they were real problems that were affecting 
relevant to the changing shape of the workforce, in particular as the workforce was more uh, uh, two genders and multi-ethnic. So it was, an, it, it was a very intelligent strategy uh, and appropriate and right. But it also meant dropping concern with inequality affecting ordinary, uh, affecting the population as a whole, the, uh, affecting or normal inequality of income and re in its redistribution. And in particular, it meant that, uh, that white men were feeling uh, that, 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 it wasn't, that nothing was being offered to them anymore. And, and that was unnecessary because the, this, the, these, the, the inequalities affecting white men were just as important as inequalities that were because of gender or because of race. So it's ordinary inequalities because of being in low income occupations, inequalities of that kind, did not, had not lost their reality. But they, were, they started to be neglected as social democrats started to try to join their characteristic concerns to neoliberal ones. Uh, and that has actually now given us a lot of other problems. Uh, I wanted to go on and talk about some of those other problems uh, uh, and about what, well, I must just signal, I suppose, to end with. Uh, I've said that um, it's, it's not difficult to find ways of tackling problems of market failure. It, it really isn't. Uh, the problems are, are not intellectual or policy design. The problems are political. The problems are two things have happened. Uh, one is that with globalization, the power of capital and of business has become greater than the power of democracy because uh, the economy is up here and politics is down here at the nation state and it can't reach. And it, it's possible for capital to, to escape the reach of individual nation states. Um, Second problem is that the support base of critical policies, which for years and years were carried by the organised working class, that support base is declining simply because they're not there anymore uh, and because it's become difficult to build new coalitions but that, that unite and bring together other groups in the population. Uh, and then in the middle of all that have appeared um, what people call right-wing populists taking part of the electorate that might have been part of a critical mass. So the, 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 the problems as to why, although neoliberalism has got so many failings, why it's very difficult to, to get a, a, a political force that effectively contests it, is the way in which power resources have changed in an era of globalised capitalism and a declining working class. But I've gone too long, so I'll stop there. Well, thank you very much for the lecture. This has plenty of time for discussion also with you from the audience. So I just to be a chair for a moment and would uh, want to see if there are some <coughs> questions or comments. Uh, after the release of these uh, Panama Papers and related things, we have seen that this supposed free market uh, you know, only works for the people who don't have enough wealth to be able to beat the system, right? Uh, and uh, there doesn't seem to be any uh, solution to that particular problem in the near future. I mean, uh, eliminated tax havens, people continually talk about this, nothing ever happens, right? But so that, that, that I think is one, in, one uh, possible thing to think about, you know, as a solution. I mean, if, if there could be a solution, right? right? Uh, the, uh, the whole climate thing, I think, is, is very, very bizarre uh, because it is precisely this area that uh, there was an attempt to impose a market solution. And, and uh, there was actually a functioning market in carbon certificates for about four years, and, and uh, several people, including uh, Al Gore made uh, hundreds of millions of dollars selling these, and uh, the one of his partners in this was um, Rhys Strong, the, uh, the UN uh, head of the Rio conference. Uh, so uh, if you look at the actual efforts that have been taken in this area, the windmills, these are basically massive transfers of wealth to the rich. I mean, 
in, in the UK, one of your biggest climate campaigners uh, announced that uh, this solution of putting solar cells on the tops of suburban houses or whatever, this was a massive government transfer to the rich. I mean, all of these alternative energy uh, things have ended up being subsidies to the big operators, it seems like. I mean, you know, none of them can, this is, are sustainable. Uh, and they've basically been bonds to the super rich that can invest in these things. Uh, so, th so those are uh, sort of my critical points. Then on the more constructive side, if we, we have, uh, a, a lot of people have, have said, well, the whole uh, austerity program uh, in Europe, uh, the, this uh, European Central Bank is uh, out of control. Nobody can really control it. There's 24 different mm -hmm. bosses, you know. And uh, they're saying, well, maybe some cryptocurrency would be the solution. I mean, you know, totally different uh, man way of managing economic life, you know, aiming to transcend the, the old system, totally. I mean, uh, all right. So do you want to respond right or mm. take more questions? Let's take a collective few, shall we? And then I'll right. yeah. so excuse Nicholas people. Then I can put myself on the list and gentlemen over there and help it. Great. Yeah, all right. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, about, I guess, a shift or an enlargement in, in the challenges of, 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 of liberalism from equality and diversity to more existen existential questions um, related to, uh, to the climate <coughs> and the question of survival, I guess. Now, um, uh, just to, to pick up what you said towards the end, that uh, we have, we have uh, ideas and measures how to deal with this, mm. that the problems like intellectual and family support base. Now, this, there was one thing that you didn't touch upon, I guess you can do a whole second lecture on this, but mm, one of the obstacles, I guess, is that mm, what has happened with neoliberalism, but uh, I guess in general also with the forces from the left wing, is a shift from uh, market flaws to government flaws. So basically, the institution that is to take care of all these problems is actually the government or the state or other political institutions. But if you look at neoliberalism, if you, if you look at social democracies and forces from the left from the late 60s onwards, I mean, I guess it's been a wide shift uh, from a focus to the market to the state and the like, believe in the state as an institution that can deal with this. And, Somehow, I mean, this informs the economic profession. It goes deeply into political parties and, and, and international institutions. So I'm just thinking whether this sticks a little bit deeper than, 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 than us having the intellectual resources, because actually the main resource to do this has been discredited, discredited mm. massively in the last mm. 40 years. I'm just wondering about your, your mm. comments on this. Mm. Mm. Well, if I may add my own, because yeah, it in fact, uh, relates to what uh, Nicholas just said, and that concerns the role of the state in the neoliberal ideology. Mm. And uh, now I understand that for you, neoliberalism is also an economic theory or economic mm. doctrine, which then informed concrete policies. But it's also perceived as a sort of over-encompassing ideology, which just simply governs the man's thinking about social problems today. That, as you said. Uh, parties would think there is no other game in town. Mm -hmm. Now, I would want to ask, how do you perceive, uh, in fact, what happens is also a sort of occupation of the state by uh, the winners of this competition, so that you have, in fact, oligarchs who do not only have economic power, but they also get governmental power and exercise it to further increase their power over the society. So in the US, Trump, yeah. Berlusconi in the past in Italy and now increasing number of governments in Europe have this problem with very wealthy people going to the government and becoming the governors. So in fact they use the state to increase their social power they already got through economic means. Yeah, I, I, th th shall I come in on all these? There's actually that last one, it links up with Nicholas's point and also your first point. Uh, it, it's something I, I, I didn't... I didn't deal with properly um, in the talk. And that is that one of the things that neoliberals 
professed to believe in, and one of the things they told us is that we need to get the state out of economic life. Now, the, the state is used, first of all, in order to establish the market and maintain the rules of the market. So the, 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 these people, are, well, there are libertarians, of course, who are almost anarchists, and they just believe if human beings are left alone, they produce the market. Uh, they don't. They produce warfare, they kill each other. But, but, it, the, uh, but, but, but most neoliberals will say the state is needed in, in order to establish property rights, in order to establish the market, some would say in order to maintain the competitive order. So there, the, it, it, it's not actually the case that neoliberalism does not believe the state has an economic role, but it does believe that, they do believe, that the state has a very restrained economic role. However, various things have happened that mean that is the opposite of the truth. Um, partly, if you, if you generate large inequalities of wealth, you generate a rich, a very wealthy class that has various things it can do with its money. Now, it might just spend its time buying yachts and aeroplanes, but it might also buy politics. Uh, and in, in, particularly in the United States, you can more or less buy a politician. Uh, there used to be limits on what, what you could do with corporate money. You, the corporations didn't have the same rights as citizens to use their money politically. A series of decisions by the Supreme Court during the early years of this century got rid of all those things. And that f corporations have most of the rights of individual citizens, which means there's virtually no restraint at all on the ability of, to fund political causes. And that means that uh, you can use your wealth to, to buy policies. Uh, that's one thing that's happened mainly in the United States, but not entirely. A second thing that happened, and that's a consequence of neoliberalism, because the neoliberalism produced enormous inequalities because of the way market works, uh, and, and then the inequalities enabled this gap between the economy and polity to be bridged. So uh, neoliberalism enabled the breaking of its own rules. Secondly, uh, one of the consequences of neoliberalism was that, what Nicholas has mentioned, the uh, collapse of a belief in the competence of the state. Now, there was, interestingly, there's a kind of fight back by people who believe in public policy. And they said, again, it started in the United States and then has spread first to Britain and then to the rest of Europe. They said, look, the state can be competent because the state can behave like a private corporation. It, 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 can have, it can give its people incentives. It can learn modern managerial methods. What we need to do is to ensure that the methods of private business come into the state. Then the state can be competent. Right? This is that. So that's the, these people are coming in from left field. I mean, they're not straightforward neoliberals at all. But that meant you had to break down a lot of the traditional barriers that existed under a liberal economy to protect the state and business from each other. So where you used to have rules in this country, for example, and in my own country, rules that limited what ministers and senior government officials could do after they left office. They, they, they were banned from working for firms that they'd worked with in their jobs. And similarly, there were limits on how business people could come into government. Those rules were all deemed to be inefficient. And it was uh, under the doctrine, of, it's called new public management. It was said that you needed to get much more exchange between the public and private sectors. And so, uh, and one of the, the biggest examples was Schroeder, the, uh, the German chancellor, who having given the Russians a load of gas contracts, has gone off to be one of the senior figures in Gazprom, the, the Russian gas corporation. Uh, they, they became, in the United States, they've always had this concept of the revolving door because these rules weren't so strict there. But you have uh, uh, people working for Goldman Sachs, 
going into the tre US Treasury saying, mm, it would be very good if we liberalized finance in all these ways so that banks could invest without much security. And then having done all that, they go back to Goldman Sachs and start to earn the money that's come uh, from that deregulation. Then they go back into the Treasury again because they want to deregulate a bit more. So you have these, the revolving door, uh, uh, which has meant that the, the, the liberal and neoliberal strategy, uh, 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 principles that say you've really got to be careful about the relationship between the state and the private sector. Those rules were all collapsed. And it's been much possible for people to use this roving door capacity to generate conditions for their firms that enable them to make even more money, which enables them to have even more political influence. And, and that's, that's what's been going on. And, and that's what's, it's, it, it's extremely hard to break down. It, it needs the reintroduction of, of the rules. Uh, it needs to, people to do what Donald Trump said when he said we need to clean up the swamp. What he meant was he wanted to get rid of someone else's swamp so there was space for his own swamp to come in. Um, so yeah, that, that deals with several of these issues. Um, and that, that question that Nicholas raised, I've got, you've got some other points I'll come back to in a minute, but there's that, that strange collapse of belief in the state um, that happened uh, just over a few years. Um, and I, I, I can remember in Britain during the, well, right, right up until the early years of this century. I, I think this is passing away now. But I remember and I, I was working at the University of Warwick. I was in the business school. And I was in the part that dealt with public governance. So I was at the real interface here between business and public sector. I was, every day I was watching these things. And you would get, uh, for example, I remember a talk. It's just one, it's just an example, but it's a typical case. Say, someone from local government uh, working in public health and talking about uh, things that needed to be done to enable people to improve their health, uh, healthy living uh, advice. And he said, well, of course, it's no good coming from me from local government. If, people, if it came from the local supermarket, people would believe them. And I thought, rubbish. You know, people don't necessarily believe a supermarket tells them more truth than the local government. But this man had been trained to believe that, that he was this wretch working in the public sector. He had no rights, no influence. Everybody must hate him. And I think that, 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 that it was a peculiarly successful example of an ideology transplant that, that took place. Uh, now, I think actually uh, the financial crisis has probably started to change minds about that. And, and I think it, it's, the, and the history, fortunately, history doesn't come to an end. You know, that, that, that notion of an end of history doesn't work. That, that what comes around goes around. And, and the, the, there's no final historical conquest by sets of ideas. Um, but it is certainly true we have come through a period when there were these beliefs that the state was by definition incompetent and, and public business by definition incompetent. Now, there, there is a kind of rationale there, you see. It, it's true that, um, that it's possible for government not to have great incentives to keep modernizing and improving. And that it, it's certainly true that, that, that there does need to be a, a pressure that the, the, the way that the market puts pressure on people working in private firms, we, we've got to get better, we've got to do better. Um, but, and that's not necessarily present on, on government service. On the other hand, it's not necessarily present on large corporations whose main goal is to improve their stock market valuation, which might not mean giving better value um, to, 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 to customers. Uh, you try phoning a large corporation. Right? You try. Uh, and my wife had this problem the other day. She tried to phone her bank because there, there, there was something, a transaction where she wanted to get some Danish krona rather quickly, uh, for a good reason. Um, we're coming here. And, and she phones her bank, and the bank have got all the phone calls being answered in India. She couldn't phone her local bank. Uh, and the a man at the Indian call center 
speaks English, but not that well. And he, but he then is able to phone someone in Britain, but she's not allowed to phone. She can't phone out her own bank. Right? They then phone him back and they say that she can't exist because her name is a man's name and she's a woman. But that's because he pronounced her name wrongly. Now that, right, now that wasn't because it was an inefficient state. This is one of the, the world's most successful and profit-making banks because they don't need to have someone who answers a phone to a customer. That's irrelevant to their stock exchange valuation, especially when there's only about four large banks in the country. Uh, and if they've all got Indian call centers, uh, then you, you can't say, well, I'll go to another bank because you won't actually be able to get out of that. What they're competing, not about service to customers, they're competing about stock exchange valuation. So, um, yeah, it's, there are interesting things here. Now, the, you, the other questions on, on different issues here. Yeah, the carbon certificates case was a scandal. That this European, see, it's a, it's a really, a, a real object lesson in the things I've been talking about and in some of the things I should have talked about but didn't have time. Um, there's a, uh, neoliberals are capable of perceiving a, a climate change issue, an environmental damage issue. And they say, right, aha, we must give market incentives to people to, to behave in the correct way. And so we, they issue these carbon certificates and that you could you had to pay for the amount of carbon you were using. And you, if, you, if, you, if you reduced the carbon you used, you got certificates. Um, uh, uh, so so you, you get a reward for reducing your carbon use. And you can then sell these certificates to, peop to countries and firms who are unable to reduce their carbon. And so they've, they've got to pay the carbon tax, but they get these certificates from you, which they can use to offset the tax, right? So you, you introduce a trading. It's meant to give a series of, of incentives to people to reduce carbon use if they can. Uh, but of course, this being about markets in a world of financialization, they're developed secondary markets in these certificates. So people were buy, selling these certificates to people who didn't intend to, it was nothing to do with carbon in the end. They were just other things you could sell. You could sell lousy mortgages, you could sell stocks and shares in companies, you could sell carbon certificates. And you put these things together in a bundle and just sell it on. So the secondary market developed in carbon certificates and it became completely removed from anything to do with, with carbon use. And it, it's an example of how in the financialized economy, everything is just about the value of what you can sell something else. So you can sell to someone else and it, it becomes completely detached from the primary activity. Um, but uh, yes, it's true that uh, building solar panels or windmills, yeah, eventually they, 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 these are things that are owned by uh, corporations and, and often quite large ones, uh, mainly Danish ones in the case of windmills. And, and it, th yeah, there's not a huge market competition, so it, it will be contributing to um, profit making. On the other hand, uh, this, this sector, the, the sort of the, the green sector of the economy, is at least producing economic activity which benefits from the green agenda. So when you have Trump and in Bolsonaro in Brazil rejecting the green agenda, because in order to make profit, the, the Americans must be allowed to continue to produce carbon. To make profit, the Brazilians must be allowed to chop down the rainforest. If you've got some sectors of the economy that say, no, actually you can make money by reducing problems of climate change, by reducing carbon use. There is a net gain there to humanity. Uh, and uh, if, if some Danish windmill manufacturers make some money instead of people in Brazil making money by chopping down rainforest, I'd, I'll accept that, it seems to me. And we, we, we can't, we're not going to get a perfect world. So uh, the, the fact that the, the green economy can be profitable uh, may be something we need to welcome. Um, uh, and then eventually try to make sure there are decent markets in that sector so there aren't so many monopoly profits. Um, um, final question was about, crypto, about cryptocurrencies. 
I, I, I don't really understand cryptocurrencies, um, so I'm not going to answer that question, I'm afraid. But um, it seems to me they, they actually are a very, very neoliberal concept. because it, It's something that Hayek, in his declining years, start, he started to say that the state should not have a monopoly of creating money, that you should get rid of central banks and you should just have competing currencies in the private market. And this is where you see the German, German, uh, German banking theory is auto-liberal and not neoliberal. Which they say, no, you need a central bank that's going to guarantee the, 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 the stability of the money. Uh, Hayek's view was you had competing currencies uh, and people would use the best currency. The, the others would disappear. Um, uh, it would be a very, a very risky world a lot of people would find the currency they were using went bankrupt and disappeared. Uh, quite apart from the fact that cryptocurrency is very heavily used by criminals uh, because of the anonymity. So uh, I don't think cryptocurrencies are going to be an answer uh, to anything. Um, and changing the way that e e ECB behaves is probably far more likely to do good in the world. All right, so we have a gentleman over there who patiently waited. Mm. Thank you very much for your lecture. Um, in the end, you said something very interesting, that the problem is not intellectual. And I agree I mean, with that, if you live in the 90s. But what did we learn from 9-11? What did we learn from the war in the Middle East? Um, don't we also need to rethink um, liberalism and principles of diversity, freedom, and such? In what way? Tell me, say more. Say more. Maybe we also need to rethink alternatives to, let's say, absolute liberalism. Right. Look, look, collect a few more. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Carol? Um, a question back to your difference between all the liberalism and the mm -hmm. and uh, focusing on the European Union. I mean, in principle, from a German perspective, you could say the order liberals did not succeed in post-war Western Germany, so they went to the European Union in order to invent a, an order liberal system. Um, my question is, at the end of the day, as it is absolutely difficult even in the European Union where we have sort of a political system to, to establish something like a social democracy mm. embedding of mm. markets, um, doesn't at the end of the day all transboundary liberalism end up in new liberalism. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the third one, then I'll do this. Um, any more questions? Yes, please. Uh, yes, I'm Dr. Peterson from CBS. Uh, I, basically, my question, thank you for a very nice lecture uh, and reading of your things. Um, is, is the title of, of your lecture is called What Institution Do We Need to Reform Capitalism? Because uh, my two cases have been reforming of the public sector. Uh, and here we switch very much in the discourse these days from new public management towards uh, new public governance, network governance. And, and, and we have a, a, a concept called, uh, uh, what is it called in English? Uh, the core subject kerne opgave in Danish. <laughs> the, what? Uh, the core subject we need to, to focus on the core subject of the public instead of all these uh, new public management uh, mm. uh, uh, new bureaucratic regulations uh, and uh, I also uh, study the collective agreement system in the public sector and, and, and have a lot of discussion about the Danish model is it ho hollow out or is it still uh, going strong and and I've been looking at a lot of collective agreement um, uh, over many years. Uh, and the problem is that we kind of, in Denmark, we still have the institutions. But now we ha have a lack of belief in the institutions. So we don't trust them. And the institutions, they kind of, they don't have the, the same social connectivity as they used to have. So it's kind of becoming an empty routine uh, that we have, a, we have a lot of these, you could say, welfare institutions, social democratic institutions. And you said we could easily regulate, but nobody believes in the regulation anymore. Even though we have a vocabulary about co-creation and we have to uh, integrate the civil society and all this, you know, from the UK, uh, we, are, we are very much inspired by this. But, but it seems we, have, we don't believe in it ourselves. 
it because I think it's because of the constitutive effects of, of uh, neoliberalism is that you have the opportunistic subjects all over, also in the public sector. So we don't believe in anything but exchange, and we have a very pragmatic or opportunistic approach to it. And I think that's a real problem, that we can build institutions, but does we believe in them, and do they have any social effects? Mm -hmm. So what institution could we build? <laughs> but, yeah, these are three very, very tough questions. Um, good questions. Uh, I, absolute liberalism. I, I said liberalism has to, in, has to be intolerant towards intolerance. It seems to me that it, 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 otherwise you end up with liberalism needing to have the courage of its lack of convictions, which is, which is not a very good thing to have. Uh, we are entitled to say um, trends in cultures that are themselves intolerant aren't going to be accepted and, and liberals have to be willing to fight intolerance. Uh, now, of course, that has often led uh, liberalism into some ghastly errors. I mean, it was um, in the name of protecting liberalism from intolerance that the guillotines operated after the French Revolution. Uh, and French armies conquered much of Europe in order to liberate them from their traditions and killed a lot of people doing it. But I still think that, that, that one cannot have a kind of doctrine that says you tolerate everything. You can't be expected to tolerate those things that themselves fight against tolerance. And I, I don't think that's inconsistent. So if there are cultures in a society that are themselves intolerant, that intolerance has to be contested. Uh, and I think we may have made mistakes in all of our societies. We say, well, you have to, you have to tolerate everything. Um, no, you don't actually. You, you, have to, you, have to, you have to protect the right of diversity, which means contesting those forms of diversity that themselves don't accept diversity. Does that answer what you're saying? Um, neoliberalism in the European Union. This, this is a very interesting issue. Uh, the creation of... Um, of European integration has always been a market project. I mean, as Fritz Scharpf, the, the German political scientist, has demonstrated that, that the, what it was doing was making markets because the easiest way of getting integration is to abolish barriers to markets. When, when, the, when you try and then do something else, something more constructive, it, it's much more difficult to get agreement. Right? So, so it has been a market-making project. On the other hand, for most of its history, it has not been only a market-making project. There's always been that uh, aspiration of creating a stronger unity among peoples, which meant more than markets. Uh, and I think you, the, the best moment, really, in the development of the European Union was at the time when Jacques Delors uh, was president of the Commission and, and possibly c continued a bit under Romano Prodi afterwards. And this was, uh, interestingly and paradoxically, uh, what was the single biggest market-making neoliberal project of the European Union, and that was constructing the single market. European single market. If you must remember the political leader who was most enthusiastic for the construction of the single market was Margaret Thatcher. Uh, now, Delors and those around him, he had a lot of wonderfully crazy people in little think tanks around him, they realised something from the history of the Industrial Revolution. The, when you make markets, you create disruption in people's lives. Therefore, making markets has to be accompanied by social policy that, that, that protects from markets and also helps markets themselves. So although, although nearly all political con conflict for the last century has been between markets and those who want to regulate them, actually they need each other. Right? Now Delors saw that. So alongside the construction of the single market, you've got 
the extension of a big welcome in Brussels to trade unions, business associations, uh, 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 and all sorts of groups to connect the European Union to civil society across Europe. Also very similar, the opening of the, the Europe of the regions, where uh, regional governments would s set up offices in Brussels. Um, the first ones to do it were, were Catalonia. And the Spanish government of the day said, this is treason. You can't have a, a Catalonian office in, in, in Brussels. This is now routine. And even British regional governments, we, we don't have regional governments, British regions have offices in Brussels. So there was Europe, Europe of the regions, and also even of, of localities, in that, that there were European uh, Union policies for attacking social problems in particular towns uh, uh, around Europe. So the, 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 that, the this original single market vision was, yes, you're constructing more markets, your marketization, but you accompany that with a whole load of other policies. Uh, the, the social chapter of, of, the, of the Maastricht Treaty came out of it as well. Um, it, it, and, and, and that, it seems to me, was the high point of understanding the relationship we need between markets and other policies. They go together. And after that, um, particularly when Barroso was president of the Commission, it moved into a much more neoliberal phase. And there's a famous day when um, John Monks, who was the British trade union official, who was the president of the European Trade Union at Congress, went along to see Barroso. And he said, I've come to talk to you about so the future of social Europe. Barroso said, well, in that case, you're 10 years too late for your appointment because we've forgotten about that now. Uh, now, that, that was the bleak moment, right? Uh, uh, and we then got this move towards a much more neoliberal uh, European Union. I think two forces really propelled that. First was the fact that there was that period from the mid-90s onwards, from, from 1995 to about 2008, uh, it did seem that the deregulated economies of the United States and the United Kingdom were more successful than Germany and most of the other European economies. By not 2008, we'd learned that this was because they'd adopted a financial model that was completely un uh, unstable. But for a long while, there was a belief that they, you've got to deregulate. Uh, secondly, um, uh, we had the entry into European Union, and in particular, of entry of judges into the European Court of Justice from the new countries in Central Europe, who, um, who, who, who were very, especially the judges, very suspicious of anything that looked like state socialism. Um, Remember that, uh, Clement uh, Krauss, the uh, president of, former president of Czechoslovakia. We want the market without adjectives. Right? No social market. No, no, just the market, no adjectives. Uh, so I think, that, uh, and certainly the EU moved from about mm, the end of the 90s through to about two years ago. Moved into a very strong neoliberal phase. Uh, and that has been deeply problematic. I mean, it's, it's, it's caused problems for Scandinavian industrial relations policies, which have been the most, uh, institutions, uh, which have been the most successful in the world. Uh, these didn't fit the neoliberal model, so every obstacle is placed in their way. Uh, and Europe came to see, be seen as something that did nothing for ordinary citizens, came detached. Um, now, I think they're beginning, I think in Brussels and around Europe, they're beginning to realise what happened here. Um, maybe we British are the sacrificial creatures who will enable Europe to, to change its ways. Um, but at another level, uh, in a way, the e something like the EU can never become totally captured by any one ideology because there's always diversity somewhere in there. There's always cha governments changing. Uh, and so it, it, it always has to maintain a kind of welcome for a range of perspectives. So for example, British trade unions have for the last, well, ever since, ever since about, ever since 1979, 
have felt a bigger welcome in Brussels than in London. Uh, and because they, there can never be that expulsion of a group of institutions uh, that, that you can get in an individual national government or in some national governments. So I think the European Union will, it, it, it will never, re it, it, it's, it will come out of its extreme neoliberal period. Um, which doesn't mean it can move in any strong direction at all, actually, but at least it, it's a place in which you will get a guaranteed diversity of policy possibilities. Uh, and then that the final points, yeah, about um, it's it, you, you've really come back to that the same point about the loss of faith uh, in public institutions. Um, it's interesting um, because it, it, Britain and Denmark stand at different points in all this. We've had this for longer, and there's disillusion with it. There are majorities in public opinion in Britain for the renationalisation of the railways, for example. Uh, and also so for taking back into public ownership water, which there can never ever be a market in water, right? That was only ever going to be a giving of mo almost medieval monopoly rights to, to individual companies to be monopoly providers of water in different regions. There's, there, there's a disillusion sets in after a time now, it may be sometimes populations have to have their noses rubbed into something to discover that they don't like it. Um, uh, but that, 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 that it, it does mean, that I, I think the answer to the question really, we, we know, we do know what the, we know how to design the institutions to do the jobs we want. Uh, you're really talking about a lack of political faith uh, and courage among the people who should be able to perceive the need for certain institutions. Uh, and I suppose it's the job of groups in civil society to try and give them that courage, to campaign. I mean, it, in the end, uh, there, are, there are some things where... We, we, we get the kind of society we deserve, really. Uh, 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 now, that's, that's a hard thing to say because there's contestation and, and, and some people fight very, very hard but still lose. But you have to fight. Uh, 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 you have to contest. And, and so if, if we get these, um, as we've got in Britain, these privatised public services, which are just not being managed well. And government is having to take back the contracts because they're failing. Now, groups in civil society point to this. They, they, they point to the emptiness of a lot of the uh, promises around privatization. Uh, for, sev for several years, we had a thing in Britain called public-private partnerships. Uh, PFI, Public Finance Initiative, PP, PPP is the general concept, the British version was public finance, public finance initiative, private finance initiatives, whereby a, the government would uh, sell a facility, it might be a hospital, to a private firm, and it would then lease back the use of, of that hospital. Uh, 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 now, that me meant you got, you, you got hosp it was a very new labour project because it meant you could get money from the private sector to, to, to build some institutions. And they will say to you, look, those hospitals would never have been built if we'd not had the, the PFI. But it has two negative consequences. One, the lease has to be paid back over years. The, the, that institution is indebted. Every year it's got to pay back money uh, for, for the people from whom it's been leased. Secondly, uh, it cripples changes because you, there's terms of the lease. You've leased it for this purpose. You can't change the purpose of it. You can't, you can't change the structure of it. And it, it's now been abandoned as a disaster. So uh, you have, learning has to take place and we have to have groups in civil society who point to the learning. We, we, um, we can't get beyond ourselves as human beings in the end. We need more disasters to believe in our own institutions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. yeah. So that's perhaps a good point to end. It's not totally pessimistic. It no, gives never. us some hope. Yeah. So uh, let us uh, thanks again to you for this lecture and. Uh, Next lecture in the series is going to take place on the 7th of December with Samuel Moyne talking about the uh, history of human rights after equality. So we are mm. very welcome to that lecture as well. So. <laughs> Thank you.